Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Shane Murphy Goldsmith, President and CEO of the Liberty Hill Foundation. Shane has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Shane, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The Liberty Hill Foundation has a fantastic mission. Just describe the mission for us, please. So Liberty Hill Foundation has been around for about 42 years. And we're a community of donors, of foundations, government leaders, and organizers who are all working together to build a more just and equal Los Angeles. How does that take flight in terms of your programs, your missions, your activities? Well, we believe that the people who are most directly impacted by the problems should be the ones to lead the fight and create the solutions. So in our case, we focus on people who are traditionally excluded from decision makers, excluded from the structures of power in Los Angeles, primarily low-income people of color, um, LGBTQ people, immigrants, low-wage workers. Um, and so what we do is we raise money from individuals and foundations, and we give it away to organizers in low-income communities of color who are working on a really incredible array of initiatives to build a more just and equal Los Angeles. And we really trust the organizers in those communities to know what the problems are, to figure out the solutions, um, and we provide them whatever support we can. So certainly we provide them with the funds that they need, but we also provide training and um, can help with coalition building, research, communications, certainly all of our relationships that we have with people in government and foundations. Um, we broker those relationships as best we can to make sure that people in low-income communities of color have the resources they need to wage these David and Goliath battles and win. Let's talk about where you're putting your resources today. I have a couple of favorite stories, I think, that illustrate how we do our work. So one is um, several years ago, we um, began to focus on the fact that black and brown boys are, were having much worse outcomes than white boys and girls in our schools um, in terms of graduation rates and attendance and ultimately employment, wages, um, incarceration, et cetera. And so we wanted to figure out what can we do in Los Angeles to improve the outcomes for boys and men of color. And because we're Liberty Hill Foundation, when we ask ourselves a question like that, we go directly to the source. So we went to youth of color in Los Angeles and we asked them, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah. Now that's a, it's an extraordinary question, <laughs> right? It's not the adults, it's not the people who are not part of that community. It's not the adults in that community, it's not the uh, the people who are outside of that community. You're basically saying, tell us. Tell us what you know. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Yeah, and I think you will find that when we when we find that we're facing problems we can't figure out how to solve, it's probably because we haven't asked the people who are directly impacted. Um, so we went to them and long story short, they figured out that there was a particular type of suspension that was happening in schools that was leading kids to ultimately get expelled and their chances of going to jail increased dramatically. And so we figured out that there was this thing called willful defiance and a teacher can, or a school can expel or suspend a kid for willful defiance, which at the time had no real definition. It was kind of whatever that term meant to the school. And kids of color, especially black and brown boys, were getting suspended for willful defiance at very high rates. And as I said, then their chances of getting ultimately expelled and ending up in jail skyrocketed. So if we could stop suspensions for willful defiance, the kids said, then um, we could change all these outcomes. And so we raised money. We um, gave it away to community organizations that whose members are youth of color to organize campaigns to solve this problem. And they were actually able to get the school board to pass to eliminate willful defiance as a reason for suspension in LAUSD. And as a result, suspensions have dropped by over 70% over the last few years, primarily impacting black and brown boys. Um, and so we will see over time their outcomes will improve dramatically. And there's no way that could have happened without the young people identifying the problem, figuring out the solution. They're the ones who spoke to the media. They're the ones who spoke directly to the Board of Supervisors. They're the ones who did tons of surveys with their friends and their schools to get a mass base of support calling for this change. And once we won it here and saw success, they were able to take it to the state level and have won some related legislation at the state level. Um, and I think that's the power of 
uh, as Brian Stevenson says, getting proximate and really getting, getting, rolling your sleeves up and getting into the work with people directly affected and trusting them and believing in their power to make a difference. The other really important magic of this particular solution is that it wasn't just stop suspensions for willful defiance. It was use restorative justice in its place. And restorative justice is a process where kids are held accountable for their behavior and they're given the support that they need both to make amends if somebody was harmed in that particular um, instance um, or to have the support to address whatever issues may have driven them to behave the way they did if in fact they were misbehaving, which is not always the case. Um, but having the restorative justice approach and the support as an alternative to suspension, that's where, to your point, where we actually get to solving the problem. Exactly. And a suspension, nobody thinks suspension solves a problem. It's just, you know, with no other options, what, are you, what else are you going to do? But if you provide another option where it is practiced, we find that teachers, because it, part of the issue, of course, is that teachers, you know, their classes are too big, they're under-resourced, and so they don't have the, they're not equipped to deal with behavioral issues when they arise. And so providing these kinds of alternatives and additional support for the teachers and the kids makes everybody more successful. And restorative justice cannot actually happen when the solution is suspension. It implies, suspension implies, it's your issue, go away until you solve it. I have nothing more to do with it. But restorative justice is not a way to disengage, it is a way to engage, it is a, is a way to uh, convey responsibility. So talk a little bit about restorative justice and how that, what what's included in the processes that are included under that rubric. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite subjects. And I will add that um, once we won this policy and saw the dramatic results, we sort of said, okay, what's next? What? How can Liberty Hill help for the next phase? And folks in these communities told us that Kids are getting arrested and incarcerated at really high rates, again, especially black and brown boys. And there was a lot of resources being invested in these, this sort of punishment system. And you know, what if we invested those resources in a system that actually supports kids, very much like what we had done with the school suspensions and restorative justice. So um, that, fast forward to a couple of years later, we've launched an initiative to end youth incarceration as we know it, which really is about um, it's another ver version of punish somebody out of the behavior. Right, we're, we're exactly. We're going to punish them until they stop behaving that right. way. Which, you know, just doesn't work. I mean, setting aside whatever sort of ideological or, you know, values you may have, the reality is that kids' outcomes are worse when they get out of jail than when they go in. So this is a really important point because if you just look at the evidence of outcomes, you, you get rid of the philosophy, which has its own merits. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't. But if you look at the results and you look at what actually works and what doesn't work, that can actually be a guide. It can get you out of the philosophical discussions, which can lead nowhere, and, and say, let's take the path that works. <laughs> it's very simple, and let's do that together. Yes. So restorative justice and this whole idea of reducing incarceration uh, rates and, and uh, requiring our system to deal with uh, young black and brown men in a different way, these are both the same theme. Right. So let's talk about oil drilling yes. in an urban environment. There are not that many places where that actually takes place. And if we were to start that today, there would be such a howl. But because of the history of oil drilling uh, in and around Los Angeles County, where people are living, um, it, it just continues. And it has severe health impacts. Yes. We forget that LA really was an oil town. And once you start paying attention, you'll notice there's these oil rigs everywhere. Right. There's this amazing story about this young girl who at the time was about 11, she's now about 18, and she's grown into an extraordinary leader. At the time, she was quite shy, but her and her mom, she'd been having the, all these terrible symptoms, really sick, and they couldn't figure out why. And so she and her mom saw across the street from their house this wall that they'd seen forever but never paid attention to. And there, there was like a door in the wall that they'd never noticed that was cracked open. And so they went over there to see what was going on. And it turns out it's this oil drilling site. And um, so this nice worker who's wearing a face mask um, to protect him starts to show them around and talk to them. And there's all these like skull and crossbone signs, you know, to say this is a toxic environment, um, which was terrifying for this young girl and her mom. And he explains what's going on, and they start to figure out that, and so long story short, this is sort of happening in these different neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles, and people start to figure out that there's this new type of oil drilling 
so these oil drills had been there forever, and it, you know, wasn't making them sick. But there's a new type of oil drilling, which is similar to fracking, although not fracking, but very similar, um, that was emitting these toxic chemicals. And so they figured out with their doctors, oh, those symptoms would be caused by that collection of chemicals. So that's probably what's causing these folks to get sick. Um, and so they started organizing, and we started funding them. And um, there was this amazing moment where they had like called all the regulatory bodies that should be doing something about this. No one would listen. No one would believe them. Um, finally, they got Barbara Boxer to come out to a press conference in front of this site at the time of day when they knew there would be oil drilling. And no one really believed them until then. Um, but at that moment, she and her staff got sick. And that was when it was like, OK, this is real. And so um, as a result, folks across in these um, densely populated neighborhoods where there's this toxic oil drilling have organized and have gotten legislation introduced um, in the city of LA and are working on legislation in the county. We also, Liberty Hill, did a report called Drilling Down, which did basically summarize the science and the research that was draws this connection between the chemicals and the oil drilling and the symptoms that these folks are experiencing. Um, and so they've been able to use that to get the city legislation introduced and hopefully soon county legislation to regulate oil drilling, ideally eliminate neighborhood oil drilling, um, but at least create a buffer zone so that it's not happening so close to sensitive sites. What do you think about this, uh, this recent uh, situation where business leaders came together and talked about the social responsibility imperative of business and corporations that joins this idea of return on investment, but also thinking in terms of return in terms of social return on their activities. I think we have to think like that. I mean, if we, if we want to have a planet for our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids, and if we want our communities to reflect our values, then I think it's going to take all of us, and we're going to have to be creative. And I do think there are trade-offs, and we can't, you know, there. The, there are infinite, I mean, there are finite resources. And when a small group of people amasses um, all the resources, that leaves very little for everyone else. So I think we have to find ways to, and really focus on you know, building the Los Angeles and the America that we believe in. And that is going to require some sacrifice. It's going to require some you know, collective self-interest, not just individual self-interest, and some creativity. And, you know, and I think we need to, I think groups like that need to sort of self-organize at first, and then I think the next step has to be partnering with folks who are direct, most directly impacted um, to make sure that you know we don't want a group of business elites creating solutions for you know kids in low-income schools. Right? That needs to be um, that needs to be a partnership. Nobody gets 100 percent respect for others, listening, advocacy, communicating, problem solving. Shane Murphy Goldsmith. Thank you so much for describing the work of the Liberty Hill Foundation, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.